Our British history is rich with tales of wealth and power and all that political nonsense. The glamour of our kings and queens, the jewels and furs and charisma, and all those heads being chopped off. But what about the real people who made everything happen? <laughs> Reg Boer! I'll discover what they ate. It's a bit dodgy. The challenges they faced? Stuff this for a game of soldiers. And how they built Britain. That's straight as a die. I'm going to uncover the extraordinary lives of some of history's ordinary people. Romans, it's quite a weight on my head, I have to say. Oh. Edwardians. Breathe in, madam, breathe in. 1950s. Put the needle on the record. Ooh, really soft brains, takes ages to stop it. And the Middle Ages. There's the executive model inside the house. Whatever. History from the bottom up. This time, I'm going back to the beginning of the last century. A time of glamour, class division, social progress, and the height of empire. The Edwardian era. At the beginning of the 1900s, the British had the most awesome fleet of ships the world had ever seen. It held the empire together and fed British industrial might. Which meant that thousands of Brits were constantly building or sailing in them. Take Arthur John Priest, for instance. Arthur was just a teenager growing up in Southampton when he went in search of a life on the ocean wave. There you are, man, the ocean wave. Oh, look, there's life on it. If this is what he'd hoped for, he'd have been disappointed. Arthur ended up as a fireman, but it didn't involve hoses. I mean the fire starter. As a fireman, Arthur's job would be to get a load of wood and coal and put it into a high pile and then light it with oil. And then the next four hours of his watch, he would literally watch it to make sure it burned evenly. So it would heat the water in the boiler above and the water would turn into steam and power the ship. Arthur and his mates were known as the Black Gang because they were always covered in soot and coal dust. It was back-breaking work in 50-degree heat just to keep the steam pressure kicking the red so the chaps in nice, clean uniforms on the bridge could really put their foot down. Mm, lovely morning for it. After four hours of feeding the fires of hell, the boys were allowed just eight hours to sleep, eat and take part in leisure activities. <laughs> before it all started again. In 1911, Arthur bagged a job on the massive ocean-going liner, the Olympic. It was an education. During one voyage, the captain decided to show off by cutting up an ongoing ship, HMS Hawk. The resulting collision thoroughly ruined the paintwork. Oh, anyone got some filler? It wouldn't be the last time that Arthur's boat got totaled, but more of that later. In 1912, Arthur got a plum job that every Black Gang member wanted, on board the Olympic sister ship. She was a little bit larger than this one. In fact, at the time, she was the largest liner in the history of shipping. She was nicknamed the Unsinkable. Oops, her real name was the Titanic. Like its sister ship, the Olympic, the Titanic was constructed in Belfast. Working inside it must have been awe-inspiring and terrifying. 29 colossal boilers heated by 159 furnaces. 
consuming 35 tonnes of coal an hour, 850 tonnes a day. All fed day and night by 205 firemen like Arthur to keep the Titanic going. Our story of Arthur is bound together with that of another person who inhabited a very different world. I suppose to most people, the word Edwardian conjures up pictures of big country houses like that one, full of gorgeous, fancy dresses. But our story is about someone a bit more ordinary. Her name is Ellen Mary Barber, known as Nellie. In her mid-twenties, Nellie took a job as a lady's maid in Staffordshire. But she couldn't possibly have known at the time quite how fateful that decision would be. Nellie's employer was an American woman, Julia Cavendish, who was married to a country gentleman, Tyrrell Cavendish. Like the other one and a half million Brits who were in service, Nellie worked her socks off just to pander to every whim of the upper class. Nellie didn't have set hours of work. She worked whenever she was required, which was virtually all of the time. Her day would start at around about 6.30 in the morning when she would wash in cold water up in her cramped servants' quarters in the attic and get ready for the first task of the day. <laughs> but Nellie wouldn't be clearing out the grates like the ordinary maids. As a lady's maid, she was at the top of the tree and followed Mrs Cavendish wherever she went. Even across the sea to Mrs Cavendish's home of America. But for now, life carried on as normal. Well, normal for Edwardians. And it started at the crack of Sparrow every morning bringing a cup of tea and some toast for Mrs Cavendish to have in bed ah. and removing the chamber pot. Someone who knows about the sort of life Nellie lived is social historian and author Tessa Bowes. So, Tessa, she's brought in the toast and the tea and she's used the potty. <laughs> what happens next? She's taken the potty away. Yeah. She'll then return and decide what clothes she needs to lay out yeah. first for her mistress. This is a clothe? Yes, most importantly, the undergarments. Starting with one of these things, the corset. Wait a minute, I've got a great idea for women's undergarments. Whalebone, barely brilliant. That extraordinary Edwardian shape didn't happen without the aid of whalebone and lacing. And uh, the corset got really important in the Edwardian era. It was tied eye-wateringly tight and often caused deformity to the wearer. So if you can imagine that the chest is out, the tiny waist is tucked back and the hips are thrust backwards. And Nellie's job is to, you know, breathe in, madam, breathe in. The Edwardian waist was tiny. The corset is holding this poor woman in. She might only wear it for two hours and there'd be another outfit to put on. There'd be the walking in the gardens outfit, the walking in the park outfit, and the hunting outfit. No, there's the blight off. Bloody corset's killing me. Edwardian fashion was inspired by the extravagance of Edward VII himself. The dresses were supposed to be sexy and evoke a feeling of constant summer. Nellie was responsible for Mrs Cavendish's fabulous collection of dresses, and she became an expert at mending them. The front is so beautifully elegant, but it's so elaborate, isn't it? It is so elaborate, and if you can imagine, um, mending this sort of, you know, antique Belgian lace and uh, perhaps a pearl falls off at a ball. Or... How would Nellie have known how to mend that? It's so complex. She would have learnt, probably going into service quite young, watching what, uh, what the other ladies' maids were doing. It was an absolute art. When <laughs> does Nellie get a breather? Nellie does not get much of a breather. Between the hours of about 8 and 11 p.m., 
when Nellie's mistress is dining and socialising and um, staying up late, then Nellie might put her feet up, but she'll probably have a needle and thread in her hands. She's always on call. <laughs> Nellie's reward for her ceaseless devotion was a salary of about £25 a year, roughly enough to pay for one dinner party at the house. The inequalities of Edwardian life were staggering, but Nellie lived in this extraordinary grey world where she was poor, but she experienced the life of the rich through travels with her lady. <laughs> And as Julia Cavendish was American, that meant trips to the USA to visit her daddy. And on the sunny afternoon of the 10th of April, 1912, Nellie and the Cavendishes travelled to Southampton and boarded the Titanic. They stepped into a world of eye-popping luxury. First class on the Titanic included a smoking room, a library, luxury piano lounge, and a choice of fancy eateries. This is the first-class restaurant of the Titanic. This is John Siggins, who's bought me high tea. I love a high tea, don't you? It was this degree of luxury, unprecedented on an ocean voyage, that the Cavendishes would have experienced. For instance, if they came down to dinner, amongst a thousand other things, they could have had golden plover on toast. Of course, Nellie wouldn't have experienced quite this degree of luxury, but she would have had some pretty good food in another restaurant just down the corridor. It is incredible, isn't it, how fascinated we still are with the Titanic and the snapshot it gives us of Edwardian life. Of course, this isn't really the Titanic. The Titanic, as you probably know, is down the bottom of the ocean. This is actually in Ripley in a garden shed which John has miraculously turned into the first-class dining room of that iconic ship. Cheers, John. Great work. The Titanic was a microcosm of the Edwardian class system, which was entrenched in every part of society. Right at the top were the Cavendishes in their first-class cabin, with their servant Nellie on hand in modest quarters nearby. Separated below was second, then below that, third class. And right at the bottom, one Arthur Priest, the fireman, working his arse off to keep the show going. To help Arthur feel at home, his old boss joined the crew too. Yes, the same captain who'd been in charge of his previous ship, the Olympic, when it had a little mishap. <laughs> Still, what's the worst that could happen? After brief stops in France and Ireland, the Titanic headed into the open waters of the North Atlantic Ocean as the captain attempted to reach New York in good time. Backs into it, men! Which depended entirely on Arthur and his mate's grunt work, shoveling a ton of coal every two minutes. And to keep him going, the White Star Line fed Arthur heartily, Sausages, sometimes meat, potatoes, beans, with a lot of salt to replenish all that lost sweat. Not to forget pudding. It was maritime law that twice a week on foreign journeys, on the menu there had to be a stodgy plum pudding known as Board of Trade Duff or Figgy Duff. Is it? Oh, it's a bit stodgy. Well, very sensible law if you like this sort of thing. <laughs> Even better, if he was on the four o'clock shift, Arthur got his food from the Titanic's first-class restaurant. What? Obviously, they wouldn't let a working-class man covered in soot anywhere near it, but he'd get a pile of leftovers sent below, perhaps even from Mrs Cavendish's own plate. And if Arthur was really lucky, it might even be a bit warm. But the very best thing was, if the weather got rough and the passengers were put off their food, there might be a lot of it. Chicken, anyone? <coughs> I'll stick with the plover, thank you. 
At just before midnight on the 14th of April, Arthur, who'd been resting between shifts, woke with a start. There was a horrible screeching thud, and everything went flying. Didn't take Arthur long to realize what was wrong. He had only one thought. Get out quick. The Titanic had hit this very iceberg below its waterline. Arthur groped for the emergency escape route. Pandemonium was kicking off throughout the ship, while right at the top, the Cavendishes were in pole position for survival. Mr Cavendish told his wife to take warm clothes and her jewellery, and he led her outside, followed by Nellie. When they got on deck, he put them in a lifeboat, which was very much like this one, and it was lowered into the freezing water. But Cavendish stayed where he was. He felt on a bound to let women and children go first. Unfortunately, it wasn't quite as orderly as this lifeboat drill. For a start, there were more people on the Titanic than places on the lifeboats, and the boats they had were launched before they were even full. Nellie's lifeboat, this actual one, had a capacity of 65, but was launched with just 23 occupants, mainly women. 20 from first class, one from third, plus two sailors to row. Meanwhile, back on the ship... Down below, Arthur scrambled up a ladder in a service tunnel all the way from the boiler room up to the deck. The ship was quickly filling with water and was listing badly. On and on, he pressed. By the time Arthur had got on deck, the Titanic was sinking and all the lifeboats had gone. There was only one thing for it. You have to jump in. The water was minus two degrees C. Arthur had just 30 minutes before he'd die from exposure. But then something amazing happened. A solitary lifeboat turned round to see if there were any more survivors. Someone spotted Arthur and pulled him out of the freezing water. He'd got frostbite and a damaged leg, but he'd survived. In fact, he and Nellie and Julia Cavendish were all alive and were taken to New York. Tyrrell Cavendish, along with more than 1,500 others, never made it. Nellie returned with Julia Cavendish to England, where they were reunited with Julia's two sons. Nellie continued to visit America with her lady, she eventually left service to become a dressmaker, but never married. As for Arthur, you might have thought he'd opt for a quieter life after all that excitement and avoid anything to do with large ocean-going ships. But no, Arthur was just getting started. In all, Arthur went on to survive four ship sinkings and three seriously damaged ones before he was finally forced to retire. You see, no one would take the risk of having Arthur on board anymore. Cool. Look at this beautifully restored old street. This is just like something that you would have seen near Birmingham in the early 1900s. Well, not quite like, because if you'd seen it then, all of this would be covered in soot. There was soot everywhere, pumping out from the big black chimney stacks which framed the landscape wherever you looked. Open cast coal mines, iron foundries and steel mills. The West Midlands was the dark heart of Britain's industrial powerhouse. And thanks to its sooty atmosphere, they called it the Black Country. But if you were passing through Black Country Village Chadley Heath, there's something else that you might notice. The constant tap, tap, tapping sound. The sound of chain making. With all that heavy industry and agriculture, to move anything, you needed an iron chain. Weighing anything from a few ounces for an animal harness to over 200 tonnes for an anchor chain. And the place to get your chain made, whether it was big or small, was here, in little old Chadley Heath. 
Almost everyone was at it, working in big workshops and in their back gardens. Everyone from small children to young men to old ladies. And if you don't believe me, this is the story of one of those old ladies. Her name was Patience Round, and she was still bashing away at her chains at the age of 79. Patience Round didn't only witness the Industrial Revolution, she pretty much was the Industrial Revolution. She started making chains back in 1841, age just 10, and kept going for 69 years. The place where she made the chains was outside the back of her house, where she had a forge set up. And she had to get up at 4 o'clock every morning. The reason for the early starts was this. She had to start up the fire, keep it going, pumping away with the bellows until eventually the light faded and she could no longer see to work. So what was Patience's life like? Carol, you're our Patience today, aren't I you? I am, I'm afraid, yes. This is Carol Davis, a modern-day chain maker, who demonstrates her skills at the Black Country Living Museum. It must have been pretty grim working conditions. Yes, you were in a, a, an awful atmosphere, uh, hot, uh, sweaty, dirty, uh, 12 hours a day, six days a week, and your children would have been helping you. They'd have been here as well. The children would cut the metal rods to length and put them in a neat pile for patients. So once you've got your length of metal, then it had to be heated up again. It had to be permanently heated up because uh, otherwise you could not hammer it into the shape you wanted. So then yeah. put it in the hole and hammer it over to get your horseshoe shape. Then what after you've done that? I have to hammer this now mm -hmm. to get it nice and flat at this end. Then put it on this part of the anvil, which is called the bicken. And ease it round, because these two pieces are going to join. At the beginning of her chain-making career, age 10, Patience would have made fine, lightweight chains, such as those used in gas lamps, and progressed to heavier ones as she grew up. How many links would she have been making? Oh, up to 50 at least. Up to 50 in how long? Uh, about an hour. Wow, so it's just over one a minute. Yes, it was, a, it was a very quick process. Was she making the same size links as her husband was making? No, no, the, the women were only allowed to make chain up to a certain size because any bigger than that would have been what the men would have made and they would have been up in arms. Was there a reason for that other than pure sexism? Uh, well, uh, the men managed to finish their work in six hours, as opposed to the women working for 12 hours a day, six days a week. So when they'd done theirs, uh, because it was heavier, big, big links of chain, yeah. they'd got their weight by the end of six, six hours. Oh, so it would only take them half as long? Yes. So they could go down the pub while the woman Absolutely. was still working? Patience was paid by weight, but with such lightweight chains, it was difficult to earn more than tuppence halfpenny an hour or five shillings a week. Just enough to cover the rent and a few loaves of bread. Patients said that from the age of 10, she'd worked relentlessly and hardly ever had a day off. She used to keep a tally of how much change she made, but after 3,000 miles, she lost count. 3,000 miles. That's like from here to New York, isn't it? Mummy, I've only done 1,826. That's 1,825 more than you. What I find so humbling is that, despite the frankly miserable nature of her job, Patience remained so positive about her work. She said she grew to love the forge because the glowing fire keeps me warm and the bright sparks keep me cheerful. Patience's sunny outlook is especially impressive because at 79, she was also supporting her disabled husband. But she'd soon have another reason to be cheerful. In 1909, a radical liberal government came to power, which included David Lloyd George and the young Winston Churchill. We're in. This will be the high point of your career, laddie. Oh, no, it won't. They promised to improve the conditions for so-called sweated labor 
which included makers of clothing, lace and chains, starting with a new minimum wage, which meant chain-making companies had to pay their workers a whole penny an hour more, an increase of over 50%. So how did the owners respond? Easy. They just refused to pay it. Do these women think we're made of money? Yeah, exactly. Aren't we? They don't seem to have noticed that your Edwardian women were learning to cut up rough. And they did. In 1910, the National Federation of Women Workers called a strike. In retaliation, the employers locked the chain makers out. So the union's media savvy leader, Mary MacArthur, brought the women's grievances direct to the British public. Patients age 79 joined the march. Here she is. Money poured in, providing strikers like patients with two shillings and sixpence a week to support them. And after a 10 week standoff, the employers finally caved in. The women had won and with money to spare, enough to build a new HQ for the union. And this is it. As for Patience, flushed with her victory, she kept chain-making for a few more years and lived to 103. Must have been that lovely black country air. <coughs> By the Edwardian period, kids were no longer being sent out to work age 10. They received free schooling to the age of 12, and millions got free school meals too. Even disadvantaged or orphan children stood a better chance. If you walked down Bonner Road in London's East End in 1900, you'd have passed a small row of houses simply known as the Children's Home. It was founded in 1869 by the Reverend Thomas Bowman Stevenson to provide homeless and orphaned children with a Christian upbringing and vital skills. Life at the orphanage was captured in hundreds of photographs, and two children in particular stand out in this one, taken in 1900. Edward Tull, aged 14, and his little brother Walter, 12. Their father, a carpenter, had emigrated from Barbados and married an Englishwoman. They had five children. Tragically, within a few years of this picture being taken, both parents had died. Edward and Walter were sent to start new lives together at the orphanage. Every morning at 6.20, a bell would ring, Walter and Edward would get up and dress, then they would rip all the clothes off the bed, turn the mattress over, make the bed again, making sure that the top sheet was turned down exactly six inches, and then they would fold up their bedclothes very neatly, much neater than I'm doing. Next, a bracing wash in cold water. And finally, they'd all stand in line for an inspection by Sister Ethel who kept the brothers and the rest of their house in order. I saw that, Ernie. Or to do nothing. After that, there'd be a task. When they were new boys, it would probably be something like cleaning everyone else's shoes. And only when that was done to the sisters' satisfaction would they be allowed to go to breakfast. Bread and Marge with cocoa. Then it would be off to chapel for prayers before a morning of lessons, reading, writing and arithmetic, geography, composition, drawing and grammar. The highlights of the day were pie and mash for lunch, and at the end of lessons, two hours of free time. Both Edward and Walter were keen on sport and singing. And they joined the choir. At 8pm, after yelling their lungs out, the boys settled into their dorms, bidding good night to Sister Ethel. No talking allowed. Night, night. Shh. But the brothers' orderly new lives were about to take another fateful turn. It all started when the choir went on tour. 
Apart from entertaining audiences across the country, the tour had got two other purposes. One was to raise money for the orphanage, and the other was to showcase the children for potential adopters. The brothers' gig in Glasgow was attended by a childless couple, the Warnocks, who showed an interest in older brother Eddie. The couple made what the orphanage described as an excellent offer for Eddie. His host is a dentist. He's willing to take Eddie, treat him as a son, and teach him his profession. And, of course, there were no social services in those days, so there was no formal interview or anything. It seemed like a good idea. So the decision was made. Eddie was packed off to the Warnocks, and his little brother Walter was left in the orphanage 400 miles away in Bethnal Green. Although Edward's new family paid for Walter to visit from time to time, Walter struggled alone. Edward did indeed begin training to be a dentist when he reached 20. Walter too began to train for a profession as a printer. He soon moved out of the orphanage to live in a hostel. As he grew, Walter developed into a powerfully built young man and a very good athlete. His great release was cricket and football. On Saturdays, he played on the boggy fields of his local Victoria Park and Hackney Marshes. Then, aged 20, Walter's life changed again. I'm just round the corner from where Walter's orphanage was in Bethnal Green at the old spotted dog ground, which is still home to the mighty Clapton Community FC. In the early 1900s, Clapton FC was one of the country's top amateur sides. And in 1908, they signed Walter. An Edwardian version of their kit is being modelled by one of Clapton's players, Dean Borhor. And this is current manager, Jeff Ockran. What was Clapton like as a team before Walter came here? Um, they were, I mean, one of the top amateur sides. Clapton were renowned for beating professional teams, such as Tottenham, Arsenal, um, at that time. This was the time when there was this gradual professionalisation of the game, wasn't there? Yes, um, and there was a big split, because everyone started as amateur first, and then um, some clubs decided to stick with the amateur routes, and some obviously went the professional route. Um, Clapton stuck with their routes. I think they wanted to kind of keep that ethos of being such a working-class club. So Walter turns up. Yes. What kind of impression does he make? Straight away, I think he started in the reserves, uh, made a great impression, made his way up straight to the first team. What position did he play? He was a forward. I think he scored 20-plus goals in his first season, again, which was kind of a big feat, coming straight up into that senior football, which he'd never played before. The newspaper reports were quite, quite well and quite complimentary of him. Young Tal created such a favourable impression by his clever footwork that he gained his place in the first team right away. Did they do well with Walter in the team? Yes, they did. They won the treble in that season and obviously won some cups. Would he have been well known around here? Would people have turned their heads when he walked past? Yes, I mean, traditionally, um, when you're a striker, you're kind of like the focal point of any team. You're kind of like the superstar. You're the one who wins the game, scores the goals. And he was definitely that. Scoring the amount of goals he did in his first season, he was kind of like the, the main guy. Walter became a local hero. But it wasn't just the Clapton fans who were impressed. There were spies in the crowd, scouts from a nearby, very famous professional club. Tottenham Hotspur had just won promotion to the first division, and now they wanted Walter. Yes! Good boy! Walter hesitated. The professional game would mean high pressure. Each week, facing a boisterous crowd of 70,000, and he just liked playing for fun. But eventually, he made the decision to join Spurs. It made him Britain's first professional black outfield player. He cost Spurs a transfer fee of £10 and a weekly wage of £4, which was standard for a pro, about twice what an Edwardian carpenter might have earned. Meanwhile, in Glasgow, in the world of Edwardian dentistry, Edward was learning the ropes of his new profession and working his way through dental college at Glasgow Infirmary. Until the Edwardian period, dentistry was mainly about removing teeth. 
painkillers cost extra. Mike Gal is a dentist, amateur historian, and coincidentally Edward's first cousin three times removed by adoption. He knows a bit about what Edward had to cope with. And what would the anaesthetic have been in those days? The early anaesthetics um, for local anaesthetic would have been cocaine. Uh, but of course, that was quite toxic and it could become quite addictive. And by 1904, we had the advent of Novocaine, which was the local anaesthetic that Edward would have been using. Why would people have chosen to have their teeth taken out when it was kind of much cruder than it is now? A lot of the time it was through necessity. So if you had pain or, or any problems, the tooth would come out. Open wide! But there are a number of anecdotes of people who would electively have teeth removed. So, you know, if you had enough money... Oh, my word. Close again, please! you would decide, look, these teeth are going to have to come out at some point anyway. They don't look very nice now. Let's just get them all out and get a nice set of dentures. There, that's lovely. So there are anecdotes of ladies when they had their 21st birthday or they're about to get married, um, they would have their teeth removed and a nice set of dentures because then that's their dentistry sorted for life. I see, Mabel. What gorgeous forces. Or if you had the money, with advances in drilling and filling, it was becoming more fashionable to actually keep your teeth. They're good as new. Then he gave me this stuff nice. and it felt great. And I had this drill and it was very handsome. Of course, it's killing me if you've got any cocaine left. Now, this is a drill, but it's not electric, is it? No, that's right. This is called a, a treadle drill, so it's a foot-powered uh, drill. So you place your foot on the pedal here. Edward's success would depend on his skill in operating one of these things. And then you try and get it going as fast as you can. Right, let's have a go. I'll get it warmed up first. Yeah, so oh, well, it's hard, <laughs> isn't it? I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't fancy you drilling my tooth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's actually a little model here if you want to have a little go and see if you can, uh, you can drill a hole in the tooth there. Oh, yeah, let's have a go. Oh, it is working, isn't it? Sometimes it might have even been a couple of appointments. The patient would have had to come back to get the job finished because it would have taken so long, you know? If I was doing it, it would have taken <laughs> a week. Would Edward have done this, do you think? Absolutely, yes. This would have been a big part of his training. And in fact, he won second prize in the Dow Medal, which was a competition for his work in restorative porcelain dentistry. Meanwhile, <laughs> Brother Walter's football career at Spurs started with a bang playing Manchester United at Old Trafford, then scoring his first goal against Bradford City. Walter impressed at Tottenham, but later that season, they played my team, Bristol City. Yes! Except not really yes. The Bristol fans didn't cover themselves with glory. Far from it. It hadn't taken long for racism to become an issue for Walter. One report said, Tull has much to contend with on account of his colour. His tactics were absolutely beyond reproach, but he became the butt of the ignorant partisan. Soon after the game, Tottenham dropped him. It's never been revealed why. For Walter, there was only one response. Cobblers. Or, to be more precise, the Cobblers. Northampton Town FC called the Cobblers because the place is associated with shoemaking. The Cobblers weren't exactly Tottenham Hotspur, but they were an up-and-coming side, and it was a new beginning for Walter. Meanwhile, in the more genteel world of dentistry, there seemed no stopping Brother Edward. After several years studying dentistry in Glasgow at the Royal Faculty of physicians and surgeons. He passed all his exams with flying colours and he was top of the class. Look, here he is, Edward Tull Warnock. That's the address of his adopted dad and there's the date of his registration as a dentist, June the 28th, 1912. After graduating with such distinction, Edward should have had the world of dentistry at his feet. He went for his first job interview in Birmingham. But the moment he walked into the door of the practice, he threw the dentist into a state of shock. My God, said the bloke, he'll destroy the practice in 24 hours. He refused to consider Edward purely because of his colour. It must have been a tough experience for Edward, 
All those years in the orphanage, working hard at school, becoming an outstanding dental student, and now all his opportunities had disappeared just because he was black. He must have worried that he'd never get a job. But thankfully, he had a fallback option, one that had been taken by so many sons of successful fathers before him. He went to work for his father, James Warnock. Warnock and Son became a successful dental practice, and Edward's reputation as a respected dentist began to grow. Edward became a fully paid up member of the middle class. He even joined Turnbury Golf Club and got to hobnob with the likes of the chairman of his local football team, Glasgow Rangers. So naturally, he put in a good word for his brother, Walter. And before they knew it, in 1914, Walter signed for Rangers. Playing for Rangers would bring the brothers back together again. At least it would have had it not been for one thing, the outbreak of the First World War. <laughs> Walter joined the 17th Battalion Middlesex Regiment, commonly known as the Footballers' Regiment. His leadership qualities were noticed and the British Army ignored its own rule book, which banned black soldiers from becoming officers, and promoted him to second lieutenant. But tragically, Walter's luck didn't last. In 1918, he led an attack across no man's land and was killed by a German machine gun. They never found his body. On hearing the news, his brother Edward was devastated. He said, it was the worst moment of my life. I just couldn't believe it. Walter is dead. But for Edward, life had to go on. He married later that year and became the proud father of a little girl. For so many in Britain, it was a similar story. A period so full of optimism and promise had been consigned to history by the heartbreaking losses of the First World War. <laughs> 